I'm sorry, Andrew, that I couldn't find sadder sounding music. Like, I don't know whether he's talking about the election of Trump or how robots are going to take our jobs or how lonely he is. But it's like somebody just put in the open AI music generator the prompt sad man. Oh, it was this Udio? What are you using now? Uh, oh, I don't know. I, I, I just, uh, I know that anytime I open up Monster Cat, I'm not going to get in trouble. So I, ju I just typed in Monster oh, Cat. Oh, gotcha. <laughs> but, but unfortunately... There, there is... <laughs> yeah, well, we could talk about this in the show, but yeah, generative AI and how it can fill in a lot of gaps. And we're seeing... I've seen musicians now like Suno and to create a thing, then they sing along or they do a better version of it and stuff, which is exciting because it's like that's the way art should be. And the ones that aren't running from it and hiding under rocks are having a lot of fun. And well, let's do this. Um, do we got that? We got that. Uh, we don't have one set up for that. That's fine though. Um, here, I'll just. I'll do that. And yeah, let me uh let me just tweak this a little bit. I'll just kind of crop this off to the side. There's multi view. Whoa, there is none. Okay, whatever. Uh you know what? I mean, your, your solo shot will have this little thing in the corner. I hope you're okay with that. <laughs> I thought we had standards here, Brian Brushwood. <laughs> Good Lord, Brian. Okay. All right. Here we go. Should I just have a runny nose, too? You know, maybe a facial scar? Yeah. I don't even know why I bothered to put on pants today. <laughs> you know, that was the conversation before the show. Brian goes, I'm ready. I'm like, I need And by the way, uh, it sounded like I was being playful when I was like, the struggle is real. But I'm like, there are times I'm like, why would I put on pants? <laughs> Yeah, I it's probably a better great show conversation, but there is I know a guy once who go you know, sat on the toilet so long, got up his legs for so weak he couldn't put on his underwear or his pants and just like fell over. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. Uh okay, all right, here. Uh, you can take us in in five, four, three, two. Hello and welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Mean, joined by Mr. Brian Brushwood. Oh, heck yes. I've never been happier, Andrew, that I have nothing to do with politics and I have no reason to be in Washington, D.C., even though I'm slightly sad that I'll be missing the We're Not Wrong live performance there. I'm mainly happy to not be there. Well, Brian, I know. I can't imagine what it'd be like to have to be in the swamp, particularly this time of year, dealing with all of that. So, lucky us. Uh, okay. <laughs> it, it sounded just coy enough that uh, that I wonder <laughs> about uh, uh, all of your efforts and, and your ambassadorship for AI. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I was actually a year ago this time. I was in D.C., uh, uh, maybe just, maybe at the White House. I was going to say, <laughs> what color was the house you were at? <laughs> <laughs> it was white. Uh, what was I doing there? Sorry, I can't talk about it. <laughs> talk about AI? Well, yeah. Um, so uh, let's jump right into it. Uh, uh, speaking of my former company, uh, I don't know if you heard of this company, Brian. I don't yep. know if you mentioned that I worked for a tiny little startup in California that's made it into the news of recent um, open AI. Yeah, yeah. So uh, now that now that you are divested uh, from the internal workings, uh, I suppose uh, I assume you got some kind of stock options or something. So it's like you are cheering for them. But um uh, uh, what a weird beef between Scarlett yeah. Johansson and OpenAI. So, so I will, I will be happy to provide my perspective of it. And also I got it there. When you leave any company, you know, there's like, you know, Hey, you, 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 you know, you can't talk about that or, you know, company secrets and stuff, which is completely understandable. And, um, I've worked in LA and I've seen like really weird contracts and stuff. So, so and nothing I saw sounded look weird or whatever to me, but. 
Uh, that caused a bit of controversy because the you know the news was like, oh, people at OpenAI are afraid to speak. Let me tell you what. If I thought they were doing something wrong, I would. There would nothing would keep me from this microphone. As you know, I've been very lucky in books and other stuff. And running my mouth has turned out really well for me throughout my life. So well, and, and, I'm not and, gonna... and I, I guess to bring people who haven't heard about it, like uh, a bunch of tech blogs are acting as though they'd never encountered a contract that said, by the way, uh, you're not going to uh, SHIT on our product in the future or you will not get the benefits that you are signing up for, which is it... super duper standard when it comes to artistic projects. Well... But... I, I don't, you know, I'd say, yeah, you and I've seen this in artistic things. It, it may be different in tech. And I want to be fairly honest that that because I'd never worked for a tech company, whatever. And I just like, oh, yeah, I've seen this stuff before entertainment. Um, and so that crazed because we also you had a number of people who've been leaving OpenAI, partially because you've had people who've been there for several years. And, you know, that if you're at a tech company for several years and it increases in value, you make a lot of money and then you start to think about what you want to do next. And so I think people were reading more into that, but there was the idea, oh, are they afraid to speak? Whatever. And I, I've said this on Twitter, like if I ever thought there was anything un unethical, they weren't addressing whatever, I wouldn't hesitate. Like I, I, you know, I've been, I have my books, I have other stuff I could, I've had, I had the, the producers of a major HBO TV series come to me going, do you want to help us do something about the insides of this company? And I'm like, um, it is Big Bang Theory. It is not Game of Thrones, and you will be disappointed by the level of drama that does not exist there. So, anyhow, but a big thing came out. So we talked about this GPT 4.0, right? Which is this model which we discussed. What made it amazing was instead of three different AIs, one that recognizes voice and puts out text, another one understands text and puts out text, another one takes text and turns it into speech. It's one model, one consistent model that you speak to. And it can understand, like, and see kind of the voice patterns, and then it can generate voice, and it can do this in a way where it can say, I am going to talk like a robot, or I'm going to speak slowly, or I'm going to be sarcastic. So we, we talked about that before. I was involved a little bit about the, in the development of that. You know, some of the early stages of that offered some input because I've worked in audiobooks, all this. And uh, I'll give you a little bit of background, like, you know, when we first talked about bringing in voiceover artists to, to record voices to use for this, I made the point, hey, uh, whoever we hire, we got to give them complete disclosures. So they understand how this will be used. There's no surprises. And we got to pay them way above standard, whatever we're doing. And open eye was like, yes, we will do that. And they did that. There was no pushback. There was nothing about anything like that. So anyhow, uh, when we wanted to create voices, we created a number of voices. And so we had, when we launched back in September, we had Co, we had Sky, we had all these different voices. We hired different actors to portray them. We actually brought in some Hollywood people who, people whose names you'd recognize to help with like direction and stuff to work on this. Now, simultaneously, you know, we thought about getting celebrity voices, like names came up. Like I like one of Jeff Goldblum, whatever. And then one of the, People that people that thought about getting was Scarlett Johansson. So and, Scarlett and, Johansson was. A, uh, I I remember specifically the very first time I saw any of the demos. Uh, I I was worried about the overly intimate way the default you know first iteration felt, and it was awkward in front of my kids. And I was like, man, I would pay money to have Jack Black, like, because because ain't nobody yeah. gonna be confused about whether or not I'm sexually attracted to my phone when it's Jack <laughs> Black talking to me. So you know. So they cast voices. They had real people trying to do that. And there was never any intent to mimic or copy Scarlett Johansson's voice. So somebody here is saying, you know, there's no never, ever. And and I will anybody who wants to challenge me on this, I I good luck. Uh and then we just had the Washington Post article because open eyes said, here, look at all of our communications, talk to the agent for the woman that was hired. Never anything we mentioned about trying to copy this. So what happened is people's first introduction to a emotive personable AI was in the movie Her or Scarlett Johansson. And that's an example of what in AI people go, hey, that's what you want is something that can feel personal, can emote, can show you real emotion. And for people who've, I don't know, not spent time in LA and listened to the average 30 year old LA actress with vocal fry, it was confusing to them. And and I've heard people go, it's like, I'm like, no, that's, I bet Scarlett Johansson, it's nothing like her to me. And other people go, it does. So I can't tell people that they're wrong. And so Point is, is they've reached out multiple times like, yeah, hey, we, you know, they went to her aid. Could we get your voice too? Could we get your voice too? And then other people go, oh, wait, it's that. Well, no, that's not. It's completely different actress, completely different voice. 
Um, and that woman, she had never been considered this, you know, never been, you know, she said her own words, like, I've never had anybody said that I sound like her. I've never had this. So again, you know, we have a chat room here and people can say, oh no, it's this. Cool. I was there. You weren't. You can call me a liar, which is fine. That's your prerogative. But I was there. And I can tell you that's what the research, that's what the, everything was shared to the Washington Post. All this has showed. Never any intention to that. There are people who thought it was Rashida Jones, by the way, when they heard the voice, whatever. So I can't convince you out of the cartoon in your head, but I can show you the receipts. And we've done that. So, yeah. Well, the, uh, 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 uh because I'm a, a, a goofball magician uh, on the other side of the world, it makes me think of like, uh, you know, originally the Aflac duck was uh, Gilbert Gottfried, but then for reasons totally unrelated to any ducks and or Aflac, they decided to drop him. And they figured out that anybody can just screech the words Aflac like that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, now, yeah, did, it... did, did, did Gilbert Gottfried suddenly say, no, I mastered that heart of having well, that voice. Yeah, and, it, and it, it's it's again like you know where the the commentary in the chat room is is that I, yeah of course I have a, I have an interest in this but I also have the facts that have we've been put out there and been demonstrated for people from the statements from the actors statements and lawyer. Yes, we've tried to get celebrities. One of the ones we wanted to get was Scarlett Johansson to do her voice. It would have been that voice plus the existing ones, including Sky. It was not a replacement. It was never that. OpenAI has had the technology for two years to do precise, completely accurate voice simulation. And had they done it? The thing that I said, pointed out too, is if it was the point was the, the idea of the movie Her, which was the AI. If it was about Scarlett Johansson's voice, then we would have just tweeted out Black Widow, you know? And it's like, well, uh, like, no, that's the point. It's the idea of this personal AI campaign that understands you. Some people confused by this. They don't want to let go of this. There's some sinister plot. Want to accuse me of, you know, lying? It's it's fine. You can do that. But well, and, I was uh, 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 boy, people really do love their narratives to uh, yes be simple. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we 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 want to believe uh, thing good, thing bad, thing uh, evil, or whatever. Um, uh, person motivated by whatever. Um, uh, Hold up, let me, let me just this. They just go start to go tear them. So they go, so your defense, it's not selling. No, it was nothing was stolen. Nothing was stolen. We hired an actress, several actresses to do voices. That's it. That was never trying to mimic anybody. Nobody. You're, you're making a claim there. And that's what people still say. Like, no, like there was never an intent to have that voice be a mimicry there. Some people thought it sounded similar. And again, that voice sky had been out there since September. It's been out there for over six months and nobody said anything. But was the moment they turned on GPT-40 and did a demo and showed how emotional it could be, they go, oh, wait, that reminds me of her. And it's like, OK, so this voice has been here six months and nobody had an issue. So what is it? And it's like, again, it's it's we have very few examples in, you know, in science fiction of personality. You know, if you have all the robots talk like this, Trek computer, how first time we get something emotional, people make a connection and they don't want to let go of it. So sorry, Brian. Uh, it's been no, a bit no, of an no, issue for the last week. I don't uh, know if you've oh, I, 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 and, and, and that's part of why I'm giving you the runway to, to clear your throat yeah. on it, because um, it's, it's very, very hard when you know the thing and you see a cartoon of it represented out in the public media. Uh, 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 you know, talk to a vo vocal coach. You're going to find out that there are, uh, I don't know, let me guess, six, seven archetypes of voices, and uh, one of them will be the uh you know later 40s uh, uh breathy vo vocal fry female or whatever uh i have a i have a friend by the way who i pushed to say we should use and if she, if they had used her it would have been even worse because she i would see how some people listen to her and she's got a very distinct voice we would think that we were really trying to emulate scarlett hansen she does a voice of a popular franchise character and it's and it's the thing like and she's not hired to be that but there is a california girl vocal fry kind of thing that you hear that um as far as should the actress come forward here's the problem that they're in like one their agent came forward they went washington post you know open eye we're in washington post the day before had a headline exactly how stupid was what open eye did to scarlett johansson one they didn't do anything to scarlett johansson so the next day they do the headline, Open Eye didn't copy Scarlett Johansson's voice for Chappie G, G record show. So Open Eye went and said, okay, we're going to have to talk to the agent, talk to you know, represent the actress, talk to everybody involved, because we just, 
If they were trying to pull something over, that would have been a very dangerous thing to do because there would have been the risk of an email or something coming up. And there wasn't because, again, like I said, I was there. There was never if I thought they were trying as as a person who is a writer who is also particularly, you know, nervous about, you know, AI and the creative industry and whatnot and the impact of this, I would have you know, screamed. And Brian knows me. Brian, uh, you know. uh, there are times that, uh, to the detriment of this very podcast, uh, when, when, as I lovingly think of Andrew interior mode, uh, it's just like, oh, he's not going to let go, is he? <laughs> yeah. No. Uh, like, like when he feels like it's clearly this way. <laughs> oh, wrong. Well, we, we, we and, had and that, Justin. That, that used to be a, a problem for the show, but, but now that I understand it's part of, uh, uh, Andrew OS, <laughs> uh, we, the truth is very had, important to when you. We, <laughs> when we ran iTricks, there was a very famous celebrity who we would cover, <laughs> and we were extremely fair with this person. And at one point, we republished something in somebody else's commentary. They threatened to sue us. And at that time, just I didn't have any money. We're broke, and we're getting all this threats of litigation and all this sort of thing. If, 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 I, if I'm remembering correctly, all you guys did was embed YouTube of YouTube video. So you didn't yeah. publish it. You used the embed code where it was hosted by Google, produced by somebody else. Like you were so far removed. And yet this person, if we're thinking of the same story. Yeah. And our, and Justin and I, we talked about it. And I'm like, I'm going to live out of my goddamn car before I back down on this. Like money is nice. Integrity is awesome. And so yes. that's, you know, I work for, I work for James Randy and we'd go after Eric Geller. I had my name named in lawsuits, you know, for, because I work with him and for calling Eric Geller a fraud, that is, you know, and hold saying on, he's a, uh, real quick, take, take a moment to just sink in that victory. Your name has been named both in lawsuits and in academic papers. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> So I, I, I don't, it's, it's for somebody to say, Hey, trust my integrity. That's not really a good reason for you to go. But I would say uh, historically I've always been, I will rather stick by what I think is right, even to the detriment because I'm stubborn. And I think we all have that in common here. Brian. Well, so, um, so, so um, j just to put a pin in the Scarlett Johansson thing, it sounds to me like, uh, like, like you with, with what knowledge you have, uh, from having had a front row seat during that time feels like, feel like there's no there, there. Um, uh, uh, maybe we can take a moment and speak to why so many people want to seize upon it. Uh, and, and granted like this is, uh, like, I mean, you and I had talked about like, Hey, uh, I sure hope nobody decides that they're trying to on purpose do her. <laughs> Say it again. Oh, I, I like, 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 uh, 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 if you've seen the movie Her, uh, mm -hmm. it's not a very flattering representation of the user. <laughs> uh, well, which is like, so, why would they want to who do that? No, I mean, I, I would, again, we could, we could spend hours dissecting the movie Her and it, in it, in Her, by the way, is like it's a meta commentary response in a way to, Lost in translation because you know Spike Jones did her in Scarlett. Jo uh, 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 Scarlett Johansson was in, yeah. Sofia yeah. Coppola did yes. uh, Lost in Translation, right? In, uh, in yeah, which have. which featured uh, Scarlett Johansson, and yeah. there's a scene where uh, Sofia Coppola, who uh, dated Spike Jones, kind of has a a stand-in for the Spike Jones character, who is shall we say unflatteringly represented in in that movie. Yeah, and there, there's the they were actually married, I believe. Um, so, but yeah, so it, it, it's a common, and I would say that you can look at it like kind of different points of view on that. But the message to her, as I've watched this movie multiple times, is it's about it's an AI. The idea of AI is it's something there at a point you need, and then you grow out of. Right. We meet Joaquin Phoenix's character. He's very vulnerable. He can't give up on his ex-wife or doesn't want to sign the papers. Spoiler alert. And then he gets this AI companion that makes him feel better and all this, but then she grows out of him and then he has to sort of learn to move on. Now, some people go, it's dystopian. It's just like, no, it's it's like lost, like in translation. She meets Bill Murray at this point in time when she's confused by life and whatever, and it's fun and whatnot, and says something to her. Nothing becomes of that, but it does become sort of this idea of she looks at things differently. And I'd say that, you know, the the her to me isn't about this 
obviously he's devastated with that, you know, the super AI, but it's like, you, you kind of like, yeah, it's like, it's probably what it felt like to date Sofia Coppola, <laughs> you know, she's this incredible person and she becomes a superstar Nova and just moves on to the next level. And so we could get into that, but I think the idea that was, was powerful was, it was an example of an AI that understood us was there for us. It was felt personal until he finds out that she's having conversations, with 20 million other people. Uh, but that idea that, we would all be benefited by having somebody there to listen to us. We would all be better off by doing that. And a lot of us don't. So the, uh, uh, holy moly, uh, uh, somebody in our chat, nine of 12 says my friend Owen wrote the, her soundtrack. That's extraordinary. That's awesome. Um, the, uh, uh so, uh, I wonder if, the uh, psychological features that are explored in the movie are about to become real because like, for example, um, uh, it's kind of a gross example, but uh, uh, like Dan Harmon publicly admitted to buying a real doll, a very physically accurate simulacrum of a silicone woman because he was just like, you know what? I'm done with actual relationships. I just want to satisfy my carnal desires and so on. Uh, and then he, has since landed in what appears to be a healthy relationship and uh, his uh, partner who is a writer in Hollywood. Uh, she wrote a, uh, unfortunately on Quibi a series about what it's like to, <laughs> to date a man who is, who at one point had a sexual relationship with a real doll. Um, uh, I wonder if we're going to go through a bit of a phase of that, with uh, uh, with AI writ large, because AI will tell us what we want to hear in you know possibly the safest uh, or one of the safer ways. Although I'm still skeptical, there are, there are things I still won't tell OpenAI because I I just I oh yeah Brian why won't you yeah, well, well, mainly because well, mainly because I'm file here I'm, I'm waiting <laughs> I'm waiting to hear whether or not they ever have a data breach or something and yeah. Uh, yeah. So I, it's, it's a very fascinating world that we're heading into. And I would say that, you know, is, is it, you know, com, you know, conversing or getting attached to an AI, a healthy relationship, unhealthy relationship, it's going to be variable. Also, there is an entire spectrum of in human relationships, healthy human relationships and bad human relationships. And I think that AI is going to follow that. There are certain AI chatbots right now that function merely for like, you know, being pretend girlfriends, which maybe help some guys. And I can see maybe some of them might be useful, but some of them might reinforce bad ideas of treating women as objects, whatever. And so each one of these things has to be judged by its own. In the chat, they pointed out, I won't listen to AI because it tells me to put glue on my pizza. In defense for the Google answers, and it said non-toxic glue. It said non-toxic glue. Okay. Wait. So I, I'm uh, unfamiliar with this story. Fill me in on this one. <laughs> so Google added a feature, which is basically you can ask a question, they'll have an AI model generate an answer for you. Like yeah. basically take the data and, and it's been giving some very wacky responses, like in a case of like, how can I get cheese to stick to pizza? And it suggests like using non-toxic glue. And then can I, should I use gasoline and spaghetti? And it says, well, no, but if you want a really spicy spaghetti sauce, <laughs> and I'm like, maybe it's right. I, we like, have to well, test it, these it, things. It, what's funny is like, like, uh, 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 if the, if the AI, this is how you know the AI doesn't truly have agency because if it was a person and it had an ego to bruise, uh, similar to Captain Spock, where he's like, uh, uh, you misunderstand me, Captain. I have no ego to bruise. Uh, if it had an ego to bruise, it might follow that up with like, come on, that was a good joke. Like, are we yeah. not telling jokes now? Is that well, off the table? Uh, oh, I saw a funny, somebody put a screenshot. I don't know. I want to believe it's real, even though it was ChatGPT where somebody says, hey, I'm having this problem, this code, it's not working. And the ChatGPT response was, it works on my machine. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> <laughs> which, which like AGI. Again, knowing, um, that, knowing that the large language model is built from things humans say, that is something a human would say. So, <laughs> so as these models become more sophisticated, something happens. Is one is we talk about there's one thing to have a bunch of text in there and say, I said a thing and it founds the most similar thing to it, right? As they become smarter, smarter happens from a process called in generalize, right? Where I can give it some information here and some some related but completely different information here that's totally spaced apart, and it might say, 
eggs are generally white and they have yolks on the inside. And over there, it can be like an egg is a really, you know, it really good aerodynamic designs. Never mention egg, but show the shape of an egg. And a really smart AI will be like, hmm, while it's training, go, that's a very similar shape. And if somebody asks me to define a really good aerodynamic design, I might say egg shaped because those two, that's called a generalization. That information was never programmed in there to say eggs are good aerodynamically, right? right. And it can learn a lot of these things. And, and you sometimes you get dumb generalizations where it'll say, you know, gasoline, flammable, flammable is like spicy, sounds good. As it, And we saw this from GPT-1, which was stupid. To GPT-2, which was sometimes smart, but mostly stupid. To GPT-3, which was kind of smart, but also made a lot of mistakes. And then to GPT-4, which got even smarter. And now GPT-4.0, we see it get better, hallucinate less. We see these generations become much, much smarter. So when you get to a GPT-5 level or whatever it's going to be called, um, no, it, these things aren't. These are, things also have to assume what you mean, which we forget. Because like you'll ask it a question. I've shown like some of these classic examples that give AI are way more ambiguous than we think they are. And it has to understand what it thinks you mean. If you misspell something, should it stop and correct you? Or should it just give you the answer? If there's missing a comma, I encountered a thing with GPT-3 where it was parsing legal documents correctly 80% of the time. Why not the other 20%? Well, the documents they wanted to test with were missing a comma and a clause. And legally, there have been court decisions that have gone completely the other way based upon the placement of a comma. I mean, uh, so to, uh, to this very day, the very bizarre phrasing of the Second Amendment with so many comma clauses, like, uh, you know, uh, a local militia being important to local states, comma, uh, uh, therefore something, mm -hmm. comma, uh, the right to bear arms shall not be un un infringed. It's like, does that mean... That that every state should have arms for the militia does it mean every person is free to you know be a gunslinger? Yeah, and we we have to interpret what we understood at the time for that to mean, and and so we can find examples of where humans haven't even agreed on this, and then we're like, well, AI should tell me. Well, you might like the answer, but that person might. So these get hard. But when we talk about where these things are going to be used, and uh, there was a study, and I don't I have a problem with the way the study was done where they went and they had people like randomly assigned to AI or randomly assigned to human counselors. And they rated the AI counselors better than the humans, but they didn't tell them they were speaking to AI. And then they told people, what do you, how would you rate it now that you know that it was AI? And like, oh, it's horrible. And he's like, oh, people hate AI counselors. No, people hate being lied to. That was the realization, but it was, there was, you know, people wanted to dunk AI. I think that uh, the data shows there's a new study that came out comparing, you know, for diagnosis and explaining things to patients. They compared GPT-4 to doctors. Guess who scored much higher? Uh, well, I, I, uh, let me guess. The one that's trained on language and verbal skills versus the one that's trained on mechanical knowledge of the biological instrument known as the human body. Yeah, and the, the one that can mimic empathy really, really well. And so GPD-4 was outperforming physicians in bedside manner and these other criteria. And and, and again, there are going to be doctors that will be much better, but on average, and guess what? We all go to the average doctor. Uh, I am excited by the ability for, I've worked, I've consulted for a few you know companies working in the mental health space. And you know, we talk about how do you use this in responsible ways? Not everybody can afford a therapist. And even if you can, you don't know if they're good, uh, i.e. BetterHelp, <laughs> you know, dot com. Uh, look up all the controversy over that. Um, and it's hard because it's like it's it, it, even doctors were bad at telling if they're good or not because, hey, how long should this take to heal? I don't know, three weeks, five weeks later. Oh, you've got a problem. You know, mental health is worse because. You're going to somebody with your problems and you're giving this to them and you become dependent upon this person. And if it's not working out, you may put that upon yourself and not their skills or their abilities. So I'm excited by the idea of one really good mental health experts to use this technology to self-check and to make sure they're providing their patients really good help. Then eventually, for some cases, just go talk to well, a bot. It, uh, along those lines, uh, I, I, I really enjoy the ongoing game of discovering yet another use for um, whatever LLM you're using. Uh, what what my wife uses it most for is to – she writes a letter as angry as she feels and then says, could you help me edit this so I don't come across as hostile? And then she's able to say the same things, 
bring up all the same points, explain why this sinkhole in our street is a danger to our community that will reduce our property values. And last week, a teenager tripped over or whatever. Uh, but, but she doesn't have to self-filter before she starts typing. She gets to say the mean one like, y'all's a bunch of bags of S-words. This uh, MF and whatever, blah, 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 blah. And then it's like, please make this civil. And then it does. And I think it's very, very good at that when it comes to like the bedside manner of things. Yeah. I, I think that in, as we, as we observe these things, yeah, we can, we can become better at it. And because sometimes there's, I don't know about this, Brian, but sometimes you live with somebody, you love them and there are things you're afraid to say to them mm. because it'll just create more controversy. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm unfamiliar with the scenario. Uh, I, I <laughs> And, and probably it works the other way too. <laughs> you know? um, the uh, uh, another um, uh, uh, th this is a functional thing. Just two two or three days ago, I was at a meeting where uh, I, I was I'm on the board of directors for a, a place. And uh, the <laughs> issue that came up because every time he says the place, I go, I can't believe this is a real. I know, place. I know. <laughs> I'm glad you understand why I don't even say what the place is. But but one of one of the items on the agenda was that the insurance company was changing the rules. They had previously said, just give us a net value of all your assets, and then we'll base it on that. You know, basically one big bucket. How much is everything worth? How much do you want to be insured for? Uh, they changed the rules and said, no, no, no. Now we need line items on what every single thing of value on your property is. And um, uh, the, uh, the, the chancellor, I asked, I asked, I was like, how long do you expect this to take? And, 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 uh, and it's a big campus. It's a big, big campus. And uh, I don't think he was flippant or inappropriate or inaccurate when he said, uh, probably four weeks of some person's full-time efforts to jot down all of these assets all over the place. And then I said, uh, please join me at your refrigerator. And we walked over to the refrigerator and I was like, yo, we're taking inventory. I'm going to open up a refrigerator. You're going to tell me what's in it. And then, uh, and then I, I did it. Uh, and, and sure enough, it said, looks like you have 37 cans of cola, two uh, things of milk, uh, whatever, 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 whatever. And I said, great, give me values for all of those. And it was funny because I said, give me values, uh, but I didn't specify what kind of values. So it just responded with 12 ounces here, three pints there, this one, that one, the other one. I was like, monetary values. And he's like, oh, uh, like about $12 about this. And I'm like, dude, uh, please, 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 20 bucks a month. Just walk around one day, take pictures of everything, and just have it describe everything. Scoop it all into a big document because at that point, you're going to send it to the freaking um, uh, insurance company. And guess what? It's not like a human's going to go over it. They're going to have their AI look over it and say, well, it seems to me like the total value of all the property on this property is blankety blankety blank. It's great. I would say... Uh... I'll, I'll do a plug right now for uh, Google Gemini, which we were just dunking on a moment ago. Um, they have built in, if you go to AI Studio, which actually a friend of mine, former OpenAI person now working at uh, Google is the, develop, is the ambassador for, or the representative for, is uh, AI Studio, which is their interface. So what they could do is they could walk around a video, just do video, Brian, of the thing, of the campus, and just take that video and upload it. And it would be very curious to see if they could do it, but you can upload a whole video of it and say, Hey, can you itemize all the items here? Oh, I think that wow. might work. Uh, you know what? I actually, um, you know, we, we've done a couple of like v YouTube uh, video tours of the property here. I, I, I would be interested to see if it could just in interpret from that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it'll be, and yeah, and, and, and it's going to be chat GPT is, co is coming with the full, with the video capability where you just, you just leave it on and run around and that'll do it. But I'm saying if you're looking for something right now, you could upload a video to probably to Gemini. Wow. Wow. Uh, and I know that, uh, uh, Google, uh, Alphabet Corporation, Google, uh, is pretty judicious about like when it interrupts your day to give you an ad. 
Uh, it's trying really hard to get me to play with Gemini. Uh, it says uh, first two months free and then 20 bucks after that. Um, I, I didn't really consider trying it out, but I, but I know you're in the biz, so I'm, I'm guessing you, you're already playing with all those. Yeah, I play as much as I can. I have subscriptions to all the different accounts, all the different services, and play at them and just understand what you know what's good for what. Um, I know I'm an opening eye show, but right here I'm telling you, if you want to do like a video analysis, Gemini is you know has built in a tool, and so if you go to AI Studio, yeah. Uh, well, now, now, now I just want to stop everything and go mess around with that. Yeah. Um, hey, uh, 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 we got a little bit of space news. I don't know if you talked about it last week. Uh, 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 Blue Origin did another. Uh, fantastic uh, uh, suborbital flight, uh, and just like they did when they sent up uh, William Shatner, aka James Tiberius Kirk, um, this time they were able to. Uh, I think this is a, a, a PR win. Uh, whether or not it's jaded for me to look at it this way or not, I apologize. But uh, a, a African American pilot was passed over for the space program, and he got Ed Dwight. What's that? Ed Dwight. Ed Dwight. Ed Dwight. Uh, uh, it, it, it seems like everything went off without a hitch. And, and uh, that's, that's probably, I mean, for, for a company that currently is positioned mm, mostly as a space roller coaster company, I think, that's, uh, I think they're doing a good job of getting yeah. strong PR hits by making dreams come true and talking less about the functionality of, of ascending to the stars forever. Yeah, I think it's great. Yeah, and, and there there had been allegations early on in the the NASA selection program that a a very famous, well respected test pilot who had been involved uh, may have been a bit of a racist and vetoed that. <laughs> which, and eventually, which, which to to be fair, would would have been of its time. <laughs> Not that that would excuse it in any way. Yeah, and it wasn't quite create the controversy. Perhaps it didn't. It shouldn't have. And so, yeah, the first Black American didn't go into space until 1983. Um, and so, I, I it would not surprise me to find out that 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 happened. And that is absolutely sad and tragic. That particularly somebody who's dedicated themselves to the country from which you know you know they decided to serve, worked hard, put their life on the line multiple times, whatever, to have somebody somewhere and say, nope, you're not good enough. That's absolutely tragic absolutely absolutely you know is a frustrating thing and i i would love for i don't know uh more stories about that than like apple tv glorifying a drug dealer pimp violent criminal you know in a happy-go-lucky series you know doing a complete spin on his attempt to flee to cuba because he was being accused of murdering a teenage girl and having all the witnesses killed off talk about the huey p newton story um and and it's like like if you you want to look for examples of black excellence, I can give you a list and we can start with people like Ed Dwight. We can start with these amazing people who clearly were what, what, uh, not what, murdering people and making their community worse. What, and so what, what is the Huey P. Newton story? I, I, I don't know that one. Oh, it's uh, Apple TV. I, I do feel so. like I got most of it out of the description, though. <laughs> so, I mean, there's the the the. The big cigar is what they call it. it's like a three episode show or whatever, and it's it's he's a co he was one of the co founders of the Black Panthers, which oh <laughs> is a very complex organization that ranged from doing food kitchens and community programs to selling heroin and actually impoverishing their own citizens and murdering people. Um, and so it's it's but we've done this at the back of a better term a whitewash of that in this idea oh they're revolutionaries and whatever like oh there's a lot going on there so. They've done this series on that, and it's frustrating because you're like, you know, uh, you know, here, here, there are people who are have put their life on the line, life and duty, whatever, selflessly, whatever, have done great things. They're not going to get that because people fall for the stupid, you know, post historical rewriting of that history to a thing, and and so um, again, and, and not not to blame Apple for Ed Dwight not getting a chance to go into space sooner. Let me make that clear. Uh, 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 yes, uh, uh, this is this is Andrew's wish corner, a feature of the weird things. Well, podcast. again, because it come, I was been up, I've been livid because this week long dealing with the whole the stupid sort of voice thing, and I'm like, wow, here's you know, like like every other company doing something stupid right now should be thanking Sam Altman because 
you know, here Apple pushes through like literally this guy was horrible. And, <laughs> and I'm like, you know, and, and anyhow, um, so uh, I am very good. Yay, Blue Origin. Thank you for doing this and getting the chance to make, to try to help make right a, a wrong that was done a long time ago. Uh, I, I'm going to guess it's been a minute since you've really poked in on, on the inside doings of Blue Origin, but, but it still seems like they're, comfortable perfecting their suborbital sub orbital uh single stage game well they they remember they've been developing the engines for the uh the the vulcan rocket right so they're trying to launch their you know the the next they're basically providing the engines for i think it's for uh ula and so they've been basically on that route trying to pursue the be4 engines which have gone to uh, the ULA Vulcan certification too. So that's been the progress. So that's the new, you know, the, the bigger thing. They have their own big, huge rocket. They're building Armstrong. The challenge is this. And I think the engineers and people at Blue Origin are great. And I think they're doing the best work within the situation they can. But it's a very different organization like SpaceX. When you you I would say that a lot of Blue Origin is just industry people who made the industry the way it was and are trying to recreate that at Blue Origin have been doing that. And that's why we're at a point now where um they still haven't gone orbital. You know, they 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 have still, you know, they're still doing, you know, yeah, like you said, the roller coaster flights, the engines, you know, um don't think the engine BE fours have ever even, you know, I, I did sort of just lose sight of keeping track of that. So, uh, well, I mean, I guess we'll see, uh, how, how soon are we, I, we know the Artemis project is uh, intending to go back to the moon under the, uh, per our, uh, ill-informed, uh, perspectives, the terrifyingly dangerous spare parts government mobile <laughs> that runs on hydrogen, which is notoriously difficult to, yeah. to, to, uh, uh, uh Keep it inside. I, let me clarify. The, the BE4 did fly in January 2024 on the Vulcan, so that did happen. That was there. So I just want to make, give them proper due. Okay, so. but 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 do, do we think that the government's going to make it to the moon, or do we think a SpaceX commissioned flight will get there first? I I'm, I don't know. So part of the problem is uh, the current plan was to use. Artemis did, was to use the the SLS basically to justify building the SLS to take the crew to lunar orbit, then use a lander. In this case, the the SpaceX won the the won that to land them from their orbit to the moon. Elon, understanding who's paying those bills, has been very quiet, un, you know, remarkably restrained for him. In pointing out, it's the most inefficient way to do it because you're better off if the Starship is full. even using a a Falcon Nine, you know, heavy would be a better thing than trying to use what NASA's plan is. But NASA, because the government, because of the Senate, everything else has to justify the the, the expenditure on the SLS, which is probably like a twenty billion more right. dollars and, right and, now. Uh, 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 real quick for anybody who hasn't been paying attention to yeah. this one because it's been a multi year Sorry. saga, uh, like uh, basically. All of Congress has to agree on a thing, but the easiest way to make all of Congress agree on a thing is if everybody gets to go home to their own state and say, I got us this part of it, which, uh, spoiler alert, uh, 50 states all have it a piece of the action on a thing, maybe not the most efficient way to do things. And, and if you get a couple key states, Florida, Alabama, and Texas, and who tends to sit on the commissions for that, so it is a... I get frustrated with NASA at times, but also NASA is limited by what Congress tells them they have to spend money on. And so it can be easy. And I'm, I'm, I'm guilty of sometimes picking them too much and get, NASA has to play a political game. But and and NASA gets as a very as the largest. But, you know, people go, oh, we should spend more. I'm like, do you think we should maybe we should spend what Europe spends on space? And people go, wait, is that a trick question? Yes, it is. They don't spend anything. <laughs> do you know how much they spend on space? <laughs> We, we spend more than everybody else combined. <laughs> um, and, and the question is, is people, we, we have been conditioned not to ask, are we spending it efficiently? And the answer is no, 100% no, absolutely not. So will they get there? It's a great question. So the challenge is this. Uh, will Artemis be ready? Will these things be ready? Like 
you know, we were it's not the same. There's Orion, which I think is the craft that's going to carry them. Meanwhile, look at Starliner. You follow the whole plight of Boeing Starliner. Uh, so, I, I, I know they they used it to at least disperse a couple of satellites recently. Uh, but no, but- no, 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 no. It's not not SpaceX. Starliner is the the Boeing uh, capsule. There was the SpaceX Dragon, right? And then there were two two companies won awards to carry air, um, astronauts into space. Boeing and SpaceX. Boeing got like four billion, and SpaceX got like two billion. And there was the who's going to be first to put astronauts into space. Well, Boeing is yet to put a human being into space on the Starliner. They were supposed to launch a couple weeks ago, by the way. And maybe maybe that's where I read be- this. Yeah. Yeah. Hours before, scrubbed valve problem. So now they're trying to decide can they fix this on the ground in the next two weeks? And there's other people saying that there's a lot more problems though. So SpaceX has been been going back and forth and whatever. And there was a time when people like, no, Boeing's going to get there first. And SpaceX has been spying astronauts on like four years now to the to the space station. So uh, yeah. I don't know, and, Brian. Well, and, I, and, I, and, I, and, uh, keep in mind, it, it is kind of a weird thing. Like there's one impulse where you and I both like to be right. And in that regard, we like you know, because we've been early boosters, so to speak, of SpaceX. However, we also know that we want humanity to win. And the way humanity wins is if there's a lot of very high qualified players in the market and they're yeah. all competing with each other. I, I, I'm, I'm rooting, you know, in AI, I'm rooting for OpenAI, but I don't want Google to give up and I don't want Meta to stop cool coming up with cool open source models that benefit from this. And same with the way I feel out space. And, and I don't, because once somebody becomes, Boeing was in the lead for so long, they got this middle management creep that just kind of took over. And then Boeing became an inept company with great engineers, but just horrible management. And we're seeing this where they're they're losing out in space. They're losing out in, you know, big contracts for selling airplanes and stuff. And that can happen to any company. I would say that as somebody who's you know a big Tesla fan and I look at, you know, I, I look at the reviews for the Cybertruck and whatnot. And I look what's going on there and I'm like. Man, I wish your CEO was around to fix things. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, I think what will have to happen is um, Jim Bridenstine, who was the former head of NASA. I think he was great. He was pragmatic. He was a big champion for commercial. Uh, Nelson, who's now in charge, was very anti-commercial. But then I think you realize the only way he's going to actually get anything done on his watch is by using commercial space to become pro. That you're going to need to have probably a president come in and make it a priority and to say, Hey, uh, I take this seriously. I'm going to put in a powerful administrator. I'm going to get Congress and everybody together and we're going to do what it needs to be done. It's just not going to happen by itself. It's just not going to do. Do you feel like there's much heat behind the chatter that we've seen in the press about, uh, uh, you know, China uh, basically positioning, you know, uh, an ability to take out many of our satellites and we need to have a defensive way to prevent that from happening, what have you. So we've been doing on the, you know, we have the Space Force now and then on the military front, uh, an interesting thing happened, which is uh, SpaceX qualified and it now is a launch vehicle for the X-30, I think it is. Remember the X thirty? Let me get the, uh, the right. That, that was the one that was like a miniature space shuttle attached to the top of a bunch of solid rocket boosters, right? Or was that the X thirty three? Or nope. it's a <laughs> a uh, let's see the X uh, space plane. Um, so X thirty seven. Sorry, I'll get my X's wrong. The X thirty seven is basically they called an orbital test vehicle, and. They use that to put military payloads into space. So, yeah, think of it as it can go inside of a housing. So they can put this on top of now a Falcon 9 as well as, you know, the other that was using other rockets to launch there. So the Falcon 9 can launch this. It goes in the housing, goes up, and then it leaves the Falcon 9, carries whatever payloads it needs to do, which can be other satellites. It can fly up to stuff. I listened to a well-placed person I mean, like extremely like running uh, the agency type person explained to me that where I was asking about capabilities. He said, well, if I had your cell phone right here and I could put whatever I wanted next to your cell phone, I could probably get a pretty good idea of everything on your cell phone. 
says, eh, if you think about what this thing can do, think about that. So there's been a big launch. There's been in the military side of stuff, we've been developing a lot of stuff. The X-37 has been doing tons of missions. Now it can be launched on a, Fel in a SpaceX Falcon 9. If Starship super, if the Starship takes off and look, if SpaceX knows, like part of the reason SpaceX is such a highly valuable company right now is that from the military contracts alone, the, the Starship is going to be an extremely viable system because all of a sudden, the Air Force, Space Force, military is going to want to have a rapid launch vehicle because that's part of a contingency. We, we've had instances where, you know, Chinese Russian craft has broken up um, and there's been cases where it could have taken out satellites and stuff. We talk about what happens if you get an incident where you take out you know, a bunch of low Earth orbit satellites. You need to be able to put things up there again. So there's a bright future there. And that will, of course, drive the innovation. Um, Math. All right. Anything beyond this, I guess we're moving beyond the news of the week and just making stuff up. Um, yeah. uh, uh, you got any picks? Yeah, well, I actually got, let me just see if there's any stories that I saved that I really wanted to get in. Um, another AI thing, uh, turns out that um, LLMs are really good at analogy. You know, GPT-4 is really good at analyzing financial statements and making good recommendations for investing. Ooh. Of course, I should point out that it's been observed before that a chimpanzee with darts is better than your average mutual fund. <laughs> true, true. You know, um, you know. Uh, ISIS has been using AI news anchors, by the way. I don't know if you know this, that ISIS has been actually been using AI to create virtual anchors. And then, but they, you know, very, very fundamentalist Islam prevents you from doing likenesses of people. So they blur the faces. So it's good. Um, uh, so I um, think that's good. I think we're good there. We can talk about next week about the orca sinking, you know, you know whales sunk a 40, well, orca sunk a 49 foot yacht in the Moroccan waters. <laughs> uh, on the flip side, also, I believe, I think it was two or three weeks ago, I read an article about what was alleged to be the first conversation with a whale. Basically, they uh, played some whale song that they were pretty sure meant, hey, come over here. And then uh, orca came over there and, uh, you know, so... Whatever. Uh, I, 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 congratulations, humans have achieved animal mimicry <laughs> by by pl playing recordings of of what may be communications. Yeah, I mean, I don't know enough to know. I, just, I saw that, and I'm like, oh, it could have been the equivalent of like you know shaving a haircut. Oh, I don't know. Say this, and they're like, "All right, yeah." The little the the land monkeys are excited, you know. Like, hello, 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 hello. Although I do, I do like the idea of even if even if let's say whales aren't as smart as we romantically would like to believe them to be, artistically, romantically, not carnally uh, uh even if that's not the case i do think there's value in considering how you would uh establish a a, a, a handshake protocol but uh, uh, with an alien intelligence because like you know sooner or later we may actually bump into on some faraway star system uh somebody that we need to have that handshake protocol with so let's talk about that for a second because it, it brings up a very interesting thought and the the challenge in talking to whales is way language could be a very different thing to us right self could be a very different thing to us and when you're you're speaking trying to communicate with what may be and, and, and remember intelligence has many different dimensions to it and so we have we have of animals we have a very high social intelligence and we have a very high ability to do abstraction and so with our ability to abstract, we can think about the future, whatever. One of the reasons that Homo sapiens may have survived as opposed to Neanderthals and other hominids that looked strikingly like us and had almost identical brains was our ability to meet strangers and not want to murder them because we could hypothesize a scenario where it's cooperative and stuff. And you might have creatures like whales that may have very low tool usage, maybe very, they don't have, they've never had to adapt or really create tools and stuff, although we see dolphins Dolphins will love to play with things underwater. They might have an extremely high level of abstraction because they live in pods and whatnot. So that's the thing is we might we might find that, you know, it, it's 
they're horrible at math, but amazing at poetry. You know that they have these different capabilities. But when we talk about meeting other aliens, they're going to have to be able to manipulate their environment in some way. And when you went to uh, you went to Indonesia, right, Brian? Yeah. Okay. What did downtown look like to you? Uh, it looked it looked very Western and modern. Downtown did. Yeah. Okay. And that is common when you when you go around the world and you go to like seaports or things like this. You could go around. You know, we we still don't quite know who the sea peoples were. You know, during like you know the ancient times, who spread part of our alphabet, whatever. And it may have been they were just people living in ports and whatever and communicated. We find that cultures that engage in trade, you know, basically engage in trade and have a high volume of trade, tend to look very similar. But it's not because they're adopting one culture. It's they're adopting the best ideas for what to do. And that means that you get this sort of plurality that you can go to a city, a big city across the world, and unless there's some totalitarian pressure or whatever to make them conform, they tend to look alike. So that might be the case that if we encounter aliens and stuff, we might find we have way more in common with them than we would think because it's always brought up to me about Star Trek because they'd go before the land like, be careful because if you use the letter L, they're going to murder you because, you know, it's like so because they're stupid and they don't understand their different cultures. And it's like, well, you know, and, and so well, uh, uh, in, in, I, de- in defense of Star Trek, usually they were the ones. No, right. Up. No defense. But, no they were the, usually the ones creeping up and like showing up like, ha ha, we're on your planet. Uh, whereas yeah. like if we were to encounter an alien species, most likely we would autom- it would probably be at a neutral territory and we would know uh, that we're fellow explorers and there are certain things we can oh. intuit similar to like, you know, the, like the Phoenicians, you know, they, they went everywhere and they were like, man, they'd be talking like this over here. They'd be talking like that over here. Why don't we just write up a code that kind of translates the sounds they make out of their weird mouths? Yeah. Let's use, you know, instead of symbols, let's use phonetics. Yeah. Phonetics. Wait Phoenicians. a second, Brian. <laughs> uh, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's um, right. I rode that ride at Disney. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I think that, like, I think the first communication should be electronic. And I, I did my rant about, like, I, I love that people have three body problem. I had fun with the TV show, although it seemed very low budget. Um, but the idea, the premise, the dark forest hypothesis, we talk about the dark, dark forest hypothesis. Is it like we haven't heard from everybody because everybody's hiding because they're afraid for anybody to find out what there are? And it's like, that just makes no sense whatsoever we we can we could count the number of people in these the singalese these uncontacted tribes tell you what their body temperature is and everything about them if they think that they're hiding they're fooling themselves we're just like yeah you guys do you we don't want the complications of this you may have ate the last person we sent there hands off well, and uh, on top of that, like there's still, I, I think there's one island in Hawaii where their number one problem is that they want to preserve their culture. But sooner or later, those children become 14 and they encounter a cell phone. And it's very difficult to keep them on that island once they discover a cell phone. Well, and that that brings up a great philosophical question. One that I've argued is that is we've talked about this before. Is it moral for us to not offer because those single those people living on the Anglin Islands, like uh, they are facing sexual abuse. We know this incest, all these other things that we we you know we consider now to be you know a denial of one's own agency over their own body. And if we say that it's okay for them and not okay for somebody else, then we're kind of denying their humanity. And it gets in. And I'm not saying there's easy answers, but it gets in that sticky kind of questions, like in Hawaii, and it's like, oh. What if we don't tell the kids that there's another place? Well, that just sounds horrible. Yeah. Um, well, right. I will. Hey, it also I, sounds like the opening to another hour of, of discussion. I, I <laughs> got to I got to bring up one more, Brian. All I right, go for it. Go more. for it. Um, so in our search for extraterrestrials, mm. there's currently some researchers have now tried to figure out what would it look like if you could spot a Dyson sphere? Uh, well, I mean, I would imagine since I re- read the documentary Pandora's Star, uh, I would imagine it's like there's just a star and then it's gone. But there's a point of which in construction, 
it would be apparent because you get a variability of that, right? It depends, like that depends on the nature of the Dyson star sphere, and I think that we are stuck in kind of our 19th century way of looking oh, at and, things. And I do, I do feel it, it has been a couple of years since we've reminded people the idea is a Dyson sphere is basically uh, let let the sun run its engine, just build you know solar panels that capture all of the energy in a total sphere around it, and congrats, you have uh, a star's worth of energy that you can use to do projects that are beyond the ken of mere mortals like us. So they've built a profile to say that we think a Dyson sphere would look like this, it would be a, a mid infrared emitter with no clear contaminants or signatures. And so they have an idea of like a Dyson sphere could look like this. And they found something like 53 candidates of that could be Dyson spheres. And the scientists say, we're sure it's a natural, we're pretty sure it's a natural cause, but as our best description of what you would look like, it would look like this. Wait a minute, wait a minute. So maybe um, let's say you were an advanced civilization and you were afraid of being uh, invaded by an even more advanced civilization, then you might want to construct a Dyson sphere in such a way that it captures all of the energy but lets out Let's say uh, this is reductionist, but the visible spectrum of light to humans or some chunk of the spectrum, like maybe it doesn't show up on like it's a star, but maybe there's no X-rays that come from it. Maybe there's no gamma rays. Maybe there's no whatever is. Uh, what, what's the goal? Uh, the goal is to not hide the fact that you're an advanced civilization, but camouflage it just a little bit. So you're not so obvious as to get caught switching the light out like the beginning of Pandora's star. Interesting. Uh, yeah, I, I, I yeah, a, a way to sort of subtly, you know, fade into the bushes. Exactly. If you will. A, a, yeah. Like, like, like Homer. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, entirely possible. And so I, I think that I like, I like that. I think that this probably would have been a bit more ridiculed 20 years ago. And I like that. I think the astronomy is, since we've been finding tons of planets and since the question comes up where it's not it's not like hey are there aliens was a crazy thing to be like it's more like hey where are the aliens i encourage this sort of thing and, and you you read this and they're like yeah it's probably natural but we thought it'd be fun to try to develop a protocol to look at it and that's healthy to me that's a very very healthy way to do it we should encourage more of that kind of speculative science where people are out there just asking big questions saying we could do this and you know i but again we could do another episode of like yeah, what happens when you, what happens when we get the signal? Like, what happens? Uh, uh, you know what? Uh, I know for sure I'll be dead by then. <laughs> or maybe not. Uh, that was one thing I really enjoyed in, uh, uh, I forget which book I was reading recently, uh, but uh, they say we don't know when the first person who will live to 150 years old is, but uh, but we do know that the one or when that person will be born. Uh, but we do know that the one who will live to a thousand will probably be born about 20 years later. It's like once, once humanity solves for a problem, we tend to be pretty good at solving very quickly, uh, forward from it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, we, we could very much be in a very rapid point of advancement and not realize it, but for another show. Yeah. Brian picks. Uh, yeah. You know what? Uh, normally I get worried when a book is selling really well. Uh, cause I assume it's about to be a reductionist kind of like pop science, uh, something or other, but I ended up uh, starting to read, uh, let me see if I can find it. Uh, hidden potential, uh, by Adam Grant. Um, Adam Grant previously, I think did, uh, Oh, let's see. Uh, I want to say it was the power of habit or something. Um, oh, by the way, take a look at this. As I just looked for the book, uh, I got, uh, uh, you, you, I'm certain that you could speak to this phenomenon of like people hear about a book. So I typed in hidden potential, Adam Grant. And the first thing is the book after that is nothing but AI generated garbage books that, that are hoping that you'll mistake it. <laughs> <laughs> for the, as you yeah. search for the words hidden potential, uh, but no, th this one is actual um, uh, hidden potential by Adam Grant. 
Um, a lot of stuff we've heard before, but uh, but I but I, I like the audiobook. Uh, it's got new metaphors for the same ideas. Cool. I I decided to rewatch Severance. Did With, you ever watch Severance? Oh, oh yeah, loved it, loved it, and and I believe. I, I didn't watch the whole thing and then watch it all again, but because it was a cord killers watch, it meant that I had to watch an episode and then go back and watch with my family the same episode. So I think I've, mm. I've seen them all twice. Yeah, I I don't w- rewatch stuff very often, and but I, I kind of I get older and kind of run out of things to watch. I kind of do kind of go back to stuff, and uh, I think I'm like three episodes in, and eh, man. It is great. It holds up. It really, really holds up. For those of you who don't know, I'm going to tell you the premise because it's explained very much quickly in the very beginning. And that is there's a procedure by which they can plant a chip in your brain, which can create an entirely different you. So there's a company that does this and people show up to go work in this office and their entire life is inside of that office. And then when they go into the elevator at the end of the day, the switch switches back and they go back to their normal self with no idea what happened there. And like great hard science fiction, it takes one idea, one idea that is currently impossible or improbable and says, what are the consequences of this? And they go, well, who would want to use this? Why would they want to use this? What's going on? And what's neat is you you can keep that premise going forever because it's not like there is a mystery of, you know, who's doing this behind it. But the real question is, if this is true, what else is true? And you can keep asking that of that. And I, I love that the, you know, it was produced by uh, Ben Stiller who directed a number of the episodes. I forget the name of the showrunners, of course, which I'm guilty of, but uh, very beautifully done, very extremely well acted, very engaging premise. They keep building these mysteries and pulling you in. So uh, severance is my pick. Uh Yes, I, I I will second your play on that. Uh, it's very very good, and unfortunately, the only way for me to tell you the particular aspects that I think are very good will rob you of some of the experience of watching it. So just go watch Severance. Yeah, yeah, solid, it's good. And they're doing. I think the next season is going to come out next year. Uh, yeah they they got a little bit hamstrung on account of the strikes and all that stuff. Yeah. But what a great casting. There's some und- there's some people that were really new or kind of I'd never seen before who are guy who plays Milchek, amazing. Oh, amazing. Yeah. Oh my god. Uh, uh just just a surreal uh, uh robotic terrifying grin. Uh 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 and who yeah, switches from charming to uh in in yeah. So uh, uh and, and meanwhile also uh, I I forget the name of the character but the dude who uh looks like as we later find, see, I'm, I'm going to take something away. The guy who was also in Fallout uh, is great. Yeah. All good. Check it out. So, uh, Brian, it's been weird. Yep. Perfect. All right. I got to go peep, and then we could do after. All right. I'll hang around, talk to everybody here. All right. Well, here. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Right. Just go ahead and talk. Um, as far as there being a season two in, I, I didn't know that they'd finish filming season two. So I'm, I'm curious about that. Um, that would be wonderful if um, they did have a season two come out this year because um, I don't want to wait for things to come. Uh, let's see. And... Looking for this. Let's check this out here. Generally, you know, Apple kind of does their announcements about what's coming over the year. And so I would think that if we were going to see that, we would see it, but it would also make for a great surprise to have that come out. Um, So yeah, you're correct. They wrapped in April shooting that. Um, it's cool. Uh, I 
it is so frustrating. I'm going to hear a rant about like trying to look up stuff and all the pop-ups because of GDPR. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, they uh, they finished shooting season two in April. So, yay. Oh, right on. All right. You ready? I'm ready. Here we go. Coming up in three, two. Hello and welcome to After Things. I am Andrew Main, joined by Brian Brushwood. Yeah. Uh, normally it's we would real make name. An, we we would not a thing a person made up. <laughs> it was. You ever have one of those moments where like you consider the possibility that you're in a simulation, and I'm like, well, I was gonna make up a name. You know that 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 double alliteration main character thing <laughs> seems like uh, uh, that's what I'd make up for myself. Yeah, it, and that, and that did sidetrack us, but like I yeah, thought about the whole. One, watching Mr. Beast and his increasingly elaborate scenarios of of things makes me more than more than convinced that we're in a simulation because I'm like, what is the version of Mr. Beast a thousand years of now? <laughs> it is literally the beast, the devil. I don't know. I just it's just that like imagine as you watch him, like, we've got 20 guys with grenade launchers, 15 attack helicopters, and a yacht we're gonna blow up. I'm like, I you were the dude that just counted to get views. <laughs> and so scale this up. So point is, uh, I thought like the alternative scenario of simulation is Brian is you, you, you know, you're there at, you know, 120 on moon base alpha, you pass away surrounded by your loved ones, your eyes open. And I'm standing in front of you going, bro, you were so good in that game. You're ready to oh go God. again. Oh, God. A, a living nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> Especially because I know I'd be all like, set me on a harder difficulty this time. <laughs> they did. Uh, did you ever see uh, Red Dwarf uh, like Better Than Life? Uh, uh, I, I've seen it? a bit of Red Dwarf here or there, but, but not the specific episode you're oh, talking you about. Red Dwarf is one of the greatest science fiction shows of all time. And 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 they they did they did they explored the is is it a simulation thing well beyond Rick and Morty to the point of exhaustion in sort of a wonderful sort of way. So it's it's really worth watching how they do that, like no budget. So uh I had a book due, and I as always, I plan poorly. I get involved in other things, but I wake up every morning. I think about the book and what I need to do. And then I sit down and sort of write the book. And the challenge of this book, it's called Mr. Whisper, a tentative title. And it brings together the characters from all my other books, Jessica Blackwood, Theo Cray, Sloan McPherson, maybe a little Brad Trasker. And it's different than what I've done before. And normally I, my first drafts are about 80,000 words. It's a good, you know, it's a good eight hour, nine hour audio book, which I like. But this has to be longer because of more characters. And so writing was a challenge. And two weeks ago, in the middle of writing this, um, I got uh, some wrist cramps and needed to figure out what I was going to do to keep this going. And I've played with dictation off and on for years. And there's a, three problems with using dictation to write, in my experience. Number one is punctuation. The weight, yeah. The, the, what has that's gotten better because like it, it, AI has gotten better at that, so that that's become better. But like one is when you try to dictate a book. In my head, I think I've got to write like an audio book and just click, you know, click, pick up my little my recorder here, click record and go. They walked into the bar, right? <laughs> just just nail everything home. perfectly, which is of and course not how it goes. I lost your audio. Oh, I uh, hopefully I'm huh. back. Yeah, uh, but but like uh, that that level of self editing is impossible. Like that's why people freeze looking at a blank page. Yeah, it, it, and it's 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 bad. Like it's exactly, and then now it's the red light, and it's like, go ahead, do it, do it. And you're like, ah, ah, I don't know. I click, and you give up. That's been my case. I. I've gotten to know Kevin J. Anderson a bit, and Kevin J. Anderson is co-writer with Brian Herbert of the Dune novels. Kevin is an extremely high, high output, prolific writer, and Kevin is known for dictation. And 
talked to him a little bit about it, but I've been watched a lot of interviews with him about it and then talked to some friends of his. And somebody once pointed out something to me that other people listen to this because Andrew, that's obvious, but it wasn't to me. And Kevin uses this really high end, nice Olympus tape recorder. That's got this thumb switch you can rock. And he only records when he has something to say. Oh my goodness. Uh, I was I was actually silently placing a bet on what the tip was, and I'm like, has it not occurred to Andrew that you could just pause, think of five different ways to say it, and then record the right one? <laughs> is is uh, was was that the epiphany? It, it well was that was the thing explained to me that that was he goes to and stops and not like because in your head like I'm gonna turn on this recorder, I'm gonna pace around and then tell this amazing story. No, and and you literally have to get in the habit of the da, 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 pause. Do you think about this thing? Whatever, because you talk about like people talk a lot about writing hands free or whatever, and you can in theory not have to hit the recorder, but if you know I'm not recording at the moment, mm -hmm. I'm free to think about stuff. It frees up your brain, and so my goal was to get as much of the process I use towards writing up until the point I have to tell my fingers what to do there, and when I write, I stop and pause and think and whatever. So. Part of it was that was the realization that you have to think about that. Another thing was, uh, how do you simplify paragraphs? How do I avoid how do I avoid certain things you have to do, like new line, new paragraph, new stuff? Because you watch people use the old dragon dictation stuff, and it's painful. And um, uh, and I tell you, I had a couple of epiphanies. But anyhow, um, I decided to build a tool for myself to write with. And because it's, well... I've built multiple versions. I have an app that I came out with years ago called Story Voice, which let you do one sentence at a time, and it figured out the punctuation for that. Double clicked it for paragraphs. It was still painful, but it was better than anything else out there that I'd use. And so for this, I said, okay, what do I what do I want to do? I said, okay, I, I have really good transcription. I can use Open Eyes Whisper. I can use a deep. I can use really good transcription that will do punctuation. I can give the previous context to it, and it will figure out the paragraphing. Right. And then I said, okay, well, what, what slows me down? And I had this realization because I was reading a book by Isaac Asimov and it was like his unicorn mysteries club. I don't know if you remember that, but you know, Isaac Asimov wrote hundreds of books. He was considered probably one of the fastest typist writers of all time. Randy, James Randy, who we both knew said he'd talk to Isaac Asimov on the phone and you could hear Isaac Asimov typing in the background as he had a conversation. And I'm like, that's amazing. Then I read this, this mystery and I noticed that he'd say, you know, uh, that's a ridiculous statement for you to make, Dunsford, said Williams. I don't agree with you. I think it makes quite good sense, said Jonathan. However, you should consider this, said Dunforth. And it's like, oh, the dialogue tags, which take a lot of time and cognitive load when I write, I could spend 30% of my time just thinking about, is it said? Should I use replied here? Because I don't want to repeat them. Asimov was just going, said, 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 focusing on the conversation. And that was a realization because I said, oh, I bet you, because it is not common in all of his writing, I bet you this was a first draft and they would have changed that later on and varied the dialogue tags, but they never did. They left them as is. So I'm like, man, I bet when he writes one, he's just writing first drafts and he's focusing entirely on the story entirely on the characters, like the dialogue and those things. And then his second draft, he might go in and add in a little more color, a little more things, change the dialogue tags, but that first draft is there. So that was a big realization for me was how much cognitive load I had to spend on doing that. So I built a, uh, I have it running right now. I actually can show you this. Um, that's right here. Um, I built a app that basically was just a web app and I'm going to share my screen with you here. And then we, you, Brian, if, jump in any time to describe what you're seeing. Oh, no, no, it's no, not I, sophisticated. I, uh, so uh, uh, right now we're just seeing a, a blank screen, but uh, it looks like uh, you're grabbing a corner of something here. Yeah. So what I did was I realized what I want to do is I want to just describe the situation in the scene. And then I want my characters to have, I'm, I just want to speak as my characters so I can create these, and this is, again, this is not 
This was oh, this, this was literally great. Okay, so 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 uh, along the bottom, I'm seeing a bunch of different names that you're replacing right now, so that basically you could just uh, when you get to a conversation, uh, you can yeah. decide if you're uh, like, if for example, let's say we're playing Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, and I was dungeon master, then I would use one particular set of cadence of voice similar to what you're hearing right now to be, you're talking to Brian, the human who's describing the world that you're in. But then when I turn into the innkeeper, I will just uh, uh, change my affectation. Oh, you weary travelers, please come inside. But then I would go back to the voice that you're hearing right now. And you know, it's back to narrator or whatever. And then all of a sudden, right. You know, when I want to represent the angry drunk at the end of the bar, I'd be like, well, see, they seem like a bunch of real pieces of work, these ones. Uh, and it looks yeah. like, if I'm going to make a guess, you have an app where you just get to talk and you don't have to change your affectation of voice. You just click on different characters. So I'm looking at an app, and I guess what I have to do is just click on the character name each time I speak. <laughs> Brian explained. <laughs> so what it did is I clicked, I made a Brian button. I clicked on the Brian button and I just repeated what Brian said. And then I'm going to click on the Andrew button. Brian, that's exactly right. I'm surprised you were able to put that together. I feel like we need and a so, third character. Uh, well, we got this one. Uh, I picked my nose so hard it hurts. <laughs> uh, I used dumb Justin here, but he said Justin. <laughs> so um, basically, so what I can do is I bit the it's not a great UI, but it worked is I just type in the names of the characters at the bottom, click enter, and it creates buttons for their names. So when I want to speak, I just click on that character's name. And what happens, I get a transcription of my speaking. Then that comes back super fast. I then take that text. I take the paragraphs, the text that appeared before it. And then I also, because I clicked that button, it knows what character was speaking and it tells the LLM, it says, in this case, I think GPT-4.0, uh, Brian just said this, correct any grammar and add a dialogue tag for Brian. And it will look at the ones before and create a complete one. So I never said Brian explained. It just said, oh, that looks like an explanation. So I'm going to write Brian explained. Yeah. And then my response, well, and you answered. And then I picked my nose so hard it hurt. So it said, well, Justin complained. And so I'm letting the AI just basically do the little dialogue tags. I go edit them all the time. Well, the words and, and, are all mine. Uh, Choices are mine. And and uh, that's one of those things where I'm I'm fond of thinking of it as, and I can't be the first one to think of it, like the, the job of the writer is really to be the first reader. So it's like, as long as you're getting the dialogue out, then future you is going to go through and be all like, okay, let's fix this. Let's fix that. Let's fix that. But meanwhile, yeah. the output, uh, uh, you speed up tremendously. Yeah. The AI in the, it's only editing. It's only acting like a editor to like a line editor to go through there and correct that for me because I, I just take away the thing that's tedious to me. And I, I was two weeks ago, Sunday, my wrists were hurting. I started to write. I'd start writing for the day. And I have a timer, by the way. I use this timer when it's when I want to go on a little side journey. Like I want to go down to do it to get distracted. I'll set some time on the timer and I'll say, okay, I'm gonna let 30 minutes go by. And I can go add 30 more, but I have to be aware 30 minutes passed. And I gave myself 45 minutes and I made enough progress that okay, give myself another 30. And I had it done in an hour. I had the thing ready and working. By that night, I finished 16,000 words. That's amazing next day i did twenty thousand. that's amazing that is so, extraordinary uh that the, i don't know how it's gonna read <laughs> i mean to be honest it'll probably read exactly the same because it comes from inside you to begin with and you're the one who knows the story and you're the one who knows like literally nobody knows the characters better than you so uh yeah you're yeah you're, you're running uh Andrew OS, uh, Storyteller OS. Yeah, we'll see. So I I am very excited because of the ability to, you know, tell stories, have as little interference between what I'm trying to do and the audience. I want I want to get rid of the friction from the idea in my head. But I also need to wear like, hey, you you 
you put a chair in the way and you people are tripping over it because you forgot to take it out. Like you have to, you, I can't imagine a complete and perfect universe and get it right without having to self edit whatever. So, but it was a very fun experience to be able to use a tool like this and just see it just so much progress. That is awesome. Um, oh man, I wish I had, uh, for a pick, a, a utility thing, but, uh, I already burned it in the main program when I was talking about like, uh, uh taking inventory using chat GPT, uh, uh, so I guess my pick will be your pick of use the Gemini from Google to upload a video to take inventory for you. Yeah, uh, my pick will be if you haven't installed the Mac app for GPT for chat GPT, I highly recommend it in writing multiple times. I would just hit you can just hit option space bar on the Mac. It'll pop up. Uh, there's there'll be a Windows version eventually, but there's also a lot of really cool Windows stuff coming out. So the different versions of that. I'm using this, you know, on the Mac, I use Automator. I created some um, Automator functions, by the way, which when I'm writing and I needed to, uh, for instance, look up something and like, so I use Scrivener to write. The problem is Scrivener is a great writing environment, but I can't create plugins for it. On the Mac, you have Automator and, you know, Windows, you have like macros or whatever, you have the things you can create there. So I went in and created a, uh, let me find a safe thing to show you. Um, um, few developer. I can show you this. So uh, this is I'm sharing with my screen right now, which is going to be the opening chapter of. I did not share the screen. So um. Oh, okay. Let me let me see if I can show you from something else. So I created. I might be able to show it from the app. Let's see this. Um, oh yeah, I can do this here. Let me go back and show you my my app that I built and explain to you the power of Automator. So let's say in the middle of writing, um, I'm doing. I'm writing. I have all these services I added. I've been using OpenAI and I've been using Grok, and so I can say summarize with Grok. And I just got a pop-up window. You can't see it, but I'll click OK, and I can paste. That just popped up. So I just got that summary. Okay. So I can uh, do which which says what? That was a summary of that. So let me let me do another. I have a little. I have a window you can't see right now, and that yeah. window in my services menu is giving me these different options. So I can do. I can say create me a writing prompt, and so it's going to pop up a little pop-up window with a writing prompt in a moment. And I'll paste that in. So basically, I used Automator to plug into these different tools to summarize my stuff and everything else like that, just to make my life easier. So uh, this is, I'm going to paste in, these are all the writing prompts it gave me, and I'm going to paste them in so you can see them. Um, Brian, stifle laugh, glance room, dimly room they're in. The true had been friends reused, but it's still amazing my ease of the conversation veered to bizarre. And so it's giving me, you know, different suggestions if I got into, a, you know, I don't use these, but it was a fun thing to kind of create was like little prompts and stuff. So I'll put together a little tutorial and we'll talk about it here on how people can kind of do that. Okay, cool. So, so, so this will be one that people will be able to play with themselves later on. Yeah. Yeah. I'll put in, if they have Mac, I'll create, I'll put the automator scripts in there, which will, you know, the very easy to install and whatnot. Well, heck yeah. Uh, 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 Man, I, I really hope Justin comes back to pick his nose. Uh, but uh, I yeah, guess but... Uh, until then. <laughs> it's been after. Nailed it. Uh, okay, Nailed it. so I, I still have to post the bones from yesterday, and I'll post both of these right now. So I'm going to jump right on that, and uh, that way nothing slides into the weekend. Um so, okay. Uh, I'm going to drop off the main stream. Love you guys. You are the best. And the stream is stopping now.